Let me take you on a philosophical journey through time, which will help you understand our postmodern culture and give you a greater respect for the scriptures. Our journey starts in the Middle Ages, where the theologians and philosophers said truth is knowable through divine revelation. In the Western world, theology was the queen of all sciences, and God's revelation, the Bible, was king. Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, viewed God's revelation as that which goes beyond reason. It's not contrary to reason, but able to take us to areas of knowledge beyond what our reason or our senses could access. For example, our reason and our senses could tell us that there is a God who is all-powerful and creative. All you have to do is look at the creation around you. But only revelation could tell us that God is a trinity, that is three separate and distinct persons existing in one eternal being. Then we move into the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries. During that time, philosophers said that truth is knowable, but through reason and or experience. Revelation was thrown out as a reliable source of knowledge and replaced with human reason and human sensory experience. René Descartes was a 17th century rationalist. His method of inquiry and doubt turned philosophy on its head. He said, except nothing is true which I do not clearly recognize to be so. In other words, refuse everything unless I can be absolutely certain that it is 100% right. If there is the slightest chance that it might be false, then I am not to accept it. So he questioned everything his senses were telling him. He asked himself, how do I know everything I experience is not just a dream perpetrated by some evil genius? Well, this thinking led Descartes to doubt everything, except for the fact that he was doubting or thinking. Thus, the only thing that he could accept with absolute certainty was his own existence. I think, therefore I am, he said. Now, once Descartes felt confident that he was thinking, he realized he had in mind a concept of something infinite and perfect. And since every cause is greater than or equal to its effect, he surmised that the source of his infinite thought must be an infinite being, God himself. Now Descartes knows two things. I exist and God exists. And since God cannot deceive, those things which appear to be clearly and distinctively real are indeed real. Now, in his effort to prove the existence of God without any reference to the Bible or divine revelation, Descartes led thinkers from a theocentric philosophy to an egocentric philosophy. In theocentric philosophy, the theocentric philosopher puts God at the center of his philosophical system. The egocentric philosopher puts self at the center. The theocentric philosopher writes in the third person. The egocentric philosopher writes in the first person. The theocentric philosopher writes commentaries where they explain what the authority or God has said in his word. The egocentric philosopher writes treatises where he sets himself up as the authority. The theocentric philosopher recognized authority, recognized the significance of God's revelation in the Bible. Egocentric philosophers, whether they wanted to or not, ended up undermining authority. And then theocentric philosophers formed what they called schools of thought. Egocentric philosophers were only uh, cared about their own private interpretation. Well, René Descartes' approach had serious implications in the history of thought. His, first of all, he insisted on absolute certainty. Now, tell me, does that make sense? In other words, does anybody really live that way? Does anybody really live with the idea of absolute certainty. For example, when you got out of bed this morning and put your feet on the floor, were you absolutely certain that you would not fly off into space when you got out of bed? Now, you were certain beyond a reasonable doubt because thousands of times before when you put your feet on the, feet on the floor, they stuck. But were you absolutely certain that this time you would not fly off into space? René Descartes insisted on absolute certainty. Second, René Descartes ended up putting human reason above divine revelation as a more reliable source of knowledge. And it caused people to question whether or not truth 
is knowable. So in the 17th and 18th century, this led to a fierce debate between the European rationalists and the British empiricists. The European rationalists said that truth is knowable. Yes, it is knowable, but through human reason. On the other hand, the British empiricists argued that truth is knowable only through the human senses or through our sensory experience. For example, John Locke argued that there are no innate ideas in the human mind. We all start out with a blank slate in our heads, which is filled by our sensory experiences. That's how we come to know reality. Well, this empiricism led to the development of the scientific method. That is the idea of discovering truth through observation. And based on that observation, we form a hypothesis. And in order to figure out whether or not that hypothesis is true, we experiment on that hypothesis. And if through experimentation, we find out that the hypothesis is accurate, then that hypothesis through repeated experimentation becomes theory. And if after even more experimentation, that theory still holds to be true, then that theory becomes law. That is the scientific method which came out of the British empiricists. Well, the debate in the 17th and 18th centuries between the rationalists and empiricists actually led to a stalemate until Immanuel Kant came along. Immanuel Kant was a German philosopher who made a distinction between appearance, what he called the phenomenal realm, and reality, what he called the nominal realm. He argued that we can never have direct knowledge of reality or the nominal realm, that is, of things in themselves. He said we can only have direct knowledge of things as they appear, or the phenomenal realm. Now, he synthesized the ideas of empiricism, that is, the gaining of knowledge through our sensory experiences, and rationalism, the gain of knowledge through our reason, arguing that our senses can only give us knowledge of things as they appear. Not of things as they are, but only as things as they appear when they are framed by the innate categories of our minds. Things like cause and effect, unity and plurality, or possibility and necessity. Well, the whole outcome of the debate between the empiricist and the rationalist in modern thought led to the conclusion that we cannot know reality. That's what Immanuel Kant said. We can only know what appears to be reality. It was then a short step philosophically from we cannot know reality to there is no objective reality. It was a short step philosophically from the modernism which came out of the Enlightenment to postmodernism, which is a predominant approach to truth today. Postmodern philosophers say truth is not knowable. And since we cannot know truth, the idea of truth as that which corresponds to reality is irrelevant. Instead, truth becomes subjective. It is my truth or your truth, and what's true for me may not be true for you. Truth is now defined as that which works in an individual's own personal experience as determined by that individual himself not by any objective standard, because there is no such thing in the postmodern philosopher's mind. Soren Kierkegaard was one of the fathers of postmodernism. He was a Danish philosopher and theologian who was fed up with the state Lutheran church of his day. Its members professed faith in an objective set of truths, in a doctrinal statement, but they did not live out those truths. So he began to teach that truth must be subjective, in other words, it must become personal, and that a personal experience of truth is more important than adherence to any objective set of truths. Thus, he became the father of existentialism. The phrase leap of faith has often been used in connection with Kierkegaard, but he never used the phrase in any of his writings. Even so, he used the two concepts, the idea of taking a leap and the idea of faith, together several times. He taught that faith is not a decision based on evidence. Rather, faith involves making a commitment to God without the evidence or even in spite of the evidence. In fact, Kierkegaard taught that if you have good evidence or reason to believe in God, then you are not exercising true faith. Faith is not faith in Kierkegaard's mind if there is no doubt involved. Second father of postmodernism is Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity. So you combine Kierkegaard's existentialism with Albert Einstein's theory of relativity and apply that to areas outside of science, and you have a climate right for denying any concept of objective, transcendent, permanent truth. All truth becomes relative and subjective, 
and that's where we are today. However, even though much of our culture has given up the search for objective truth, many still have a lot of respect for the scientific method. A lot of people in our culture assume that good scientists are objective observers of reality who arrive at their conclusions without prejudice. But is that really the case? You remember watching the video, The Business of Paradigms by Joe Barker. In that video, he argued that everyone, including scientists, look at the world through a particular paradigm that is a system of rules and regulations that establish boundaries and offer guidelines for solving problems. These paradigms influence the way people see the world and causes them to ignore or to distort data that does not fit their paradigm. Think about the implications of this paradigm effect on the conclusions of scientists. If they ignore or distort data that does not fit their paradigm, can we truly trust their conclusions? Scientists have concluded that evolution is the way the universe came to be. And so many people today assume that evolution is science and creationism is religion. And therefore, if you're going to believe the Bible's account of creation, you have to believe it against the scientific evidence. Now, that would be okay for Kierkegaard because he says true faith actually goes against the evidence. But that's not good for too many people in our culture. In fact, I believe it's one of the reasons why the majority of young people that grew up in Bible-believing evangelical homes are giving up on the Christian faith. They've been to high school and college where they're taught that evolution is the scientist, it's the scientist's conclusion and creationism is simply a religious dogma. So what do we say to these young people and to many in our society who believe the same thing? Is creationism a simply religious doctrine? Is not evolution also a religious doctrine? To use Joel Barker's term, a paradigm through which many scientists view the world which prevents them from seeing evidence of special design in creation. Before Darwin in the 19th century, creationism was the accepted paradigm in the Western world. But since then, creationism was overthrown by another paradigm, evolution. When Darwin first proposed natural selection as a hypothesis to explain the origin of species, there was very little evidence to support it. Paleontology, the study of fossils, was a relatively new science, and there were no transitional forms in the fossil record to support the hypothesis. Today, over 150 years later, that is still the case. Dr. David Raup was at one time curator of the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago and the top evolutionary biologist in the country. Now, I knew him personally because he had retired in the mid-1990s to Washington Island in Lake Michigan, where I actually spent seven and a half years pastoring a small church. We served on the Washington Island Community Health Program Board together and had many private conversations. I've been in his home and we discussed the issue of origins a few times. Here's what he had to say about the fossil record in 1979. Darwin's general solution to the incompatibility of fossil evidence in his theory was to say that the fossil record is a very incomplete one that is still full of gaps and that we have much to learn. In effect, he was saying that if the record were complete and if we had better knowledge of it, we would see the finely graduated chain that he predicted. And this was his main argument for downgrading the evidence from the fossil record. Well, we are now 120 years after Darwin, and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation has not changed much. The record of evolution is still surprisingly jerky, and ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. By this, I mean that some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. What appeared to be a nice, simple progression when relatively few data were available now appears to be much more complex and much less gradualistic. So Darwin's problem has not been alleviated in the last 120 years, and we still have a record which does show change, but one that can hardly be looked upon as the most reasonable consequence of natural selection. As of just two or three years ago in my conversation with him, he still maintained that Darwin's problem of the lack of evidence in the fossil record has yet to be alleviated. 
In other words, more than 150 years after the publication of his Origin of the Species in 1859, there is still no hard evidence to support Darwin's evolutionary hypothesis. Why is it then that many scientists still stubbornly hold on to the evolutionary paradigm? Is it not because the data supports it? No, it doesn't. Could it be that to change paradigms would be too disruptive to the scientific community? It would be occupational suicide for a scientist to adopt a different paradigm, just what, like it was for Galileo in his day. I maintain that belief in evolution is as much a religion, if not more so, than belief in special creation. In fact, evolution, one species changing into another species, has been a Hindu doctrine for centuries. The Hindu theologians gave a spiritual explanation for the change and called it reincarnation. Darwin took that same concept and gave it a so-called naturalistic explanation. What many don't realize is that Darwin also used his hypothesis to support the superiority of the Aryan race. The original title of his book was actually On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Eighty years later, Hitler used Darwin's hypothesis to justify the elimination of the so-called weaker races and murdered six million Jews as a result. But what makes the creation paradigm any better? Well, I believe that there is actual hard evidence to support it. Just one example. All you have to do is look at the complex design in nature, and there is no question that an intelligent designer put it together. Well, if human reason and science are inadequate sources of knowledge, what is an adequate source of knowledge? Kant said we cannot access the nominal or the real world through our reason and senses. But what if someone from the nominal world, the real world, came into our world and revealed aspects of his world to us? Could we not then know some things in themselves as they really are? Well, that's exactly what God did. He came into our world and revealed the truth, the only truth that we can actually know. God became a man and gave us his word, and that is the only reliable source of knowledge we have today. The question is, can we trust the Bible? Can we really determine whether or not it came from God? Where there are, well, there are several proofs for the divine source of the Bible for its inspiration. First, let's take the Bible's claim for itself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is inspired by God. Then we have Christ's claims for the Bible. In John 10, 35, referring to the Old Testament, Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. It's authoritative. You can't go against it. And then in John 14 and 16, referring to the New Testament before it was written, Jesus told the apostles, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. And when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Jesus was saying to his apostles that when they record what Jesus said and did and talk about its implications for our lives, when they write down what is now our New Testament, that they will be guided by the Holy Spirit and he will guide them into all truth. Jesus claims for both the Old and New Testament is that they both come from God himself. And then we have the evidence of fulfilled prophecy. You see, only God knows the future and can predict it accurately. Human beings, we can guess about the future and sometimes be pretty good guessers, but only God knows it explicitly. And that's what the Bible does hundreds of times. It predicts the future specifically and accurately. Therefore, the Bible must be the Word of God. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of Nostradamus. His most ominous riddle and one of his most explicit, written over 450 years ago, goes like this. In the year 1999, in seven months, the great king of terror will come from the sky. He will bring back to life the great king of the Mongols before and after war reigns happily unrestrained. Now, I remember teaching a philosophy class in July of 1999, and we had fun with this prophecy. I asked the class, has this prophecy come true? And if it did, how would you know whether or not it came true? 
You see, the prophecy is so nebulous, anything can fit. Biblical prophecy is very different. It is very specific. Let me give you some examples. Ezekiel 26 predicted the destruction of Tyre and made this interesting comment. As God speaks, I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. Out in the sea she'll become a place to spread fish nets. You know that's exactly what happened. When the Babylonians came down to destroy the city, the people of Tyre fled to a nearby island. Then, hundreds of years later, Alexander the Great came down on Tyre, at this time on the island. But in order to get to them, he scraped the old city of Tyre flat. He took its rocks and its ruins and used them to build a causeway to the island. It was literally made like a bare rock and is now used by the fishermen for the spreading of nets. Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 records Daniel's amazing prophecies of coming world kingdoms. He talks about Babylon. Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And he describes in amazing detail the nature of these world powers hundreds of years before some of them came to power. One of Daniel's most amazing prophecies is Daniel 9.25, which predicts the exact time of Messiah's triumphal entry into Jerusalem nearly 500 years before it happened. Daniel 9.25 says this, Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. That's a total of sixty-nine sevens of years, or if you do the multiplication, that's 483 years. Now, the biblical calendar year is 360 days, not our 365 and a third days. So, the 483 years translates into 173,000 880 days. Thus, Daniel predicts 500 years before the event that Messiah, the Anointed One, will make his entry as the prince or the king 173,880 days after a decree is made to rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in ruins the time Daniel writes this prophecy. Well, that decree to rebuild Jerusalem was made by King Artaxerxes in Nehemiah's time on March 5, 444 B.C. Now, if you add 173,880 days to March 5th, 440 B.C., you come up with March 30th, A.D. 33. March 30th, A.D. 33 is the exact date scholars have determined that Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem as king, a date predicted more than 500 years before it happened, after which Daniel predicted that Messiah would be cut off. How did Daniel know the future? God had to reveal it to him. Jesus actually fulfilled 333 Old Testament prophecies during his lifetime. It is possible that Jesus deliberately set out to fulfill some of these prophecies, but many of them were totally beyond human control. These include the following eight. First, the place of his birth, predicted in Micah 5.2. Second, the time of his birth, predicted in 9, Daniel 9.25 and also in Genesis 49.10. Third, the manner of his birth, predicted in Isaiah 7.14 to a virgin. Fourth, the, his betrayal. Fifth, his manner of death, predicted in Psalm 22, verse 16. Also, we have six people's reactions of Jesus piercing on the cross, predicted in Psalm 22, and his burial with the rich, predicted in Psalm, Isaiah 53. Now, is this a coincidence? No. Peter Stoner, a mathematician, says that using the modern science of probability in reference to eight, these eight prophecies, quote, we find that the chance that any man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled all eight prophecies is one in ten to the seventeenth power. That would be one in one hundred quadrillion. Now, in order to help us comprehend the staggering probability Stoner illustrates it by supposing that we take 10 to the 17th silver, power, silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mess thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up the marked silver dollar on the first try. What chance would he have of getting the right one on the first try? just the same chance that the prophets would have had in writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to the present time, providing they wrote in their own wisdom. And yet Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. 
Fulfilled prophecy gives us strong evidence for the inspiration of the Bible. And we've only scratched the surface here. There are hundreds of prophecies just like these that have been fulfilled to the letter very specifically. Let me tell you, only God could write a book like the Bible. But there is even more evidence for the inspiration and authority of the Bible. Take the archaeological discoveries. You know, critics of the Bible used to deny the existence of Nineveh until the 19th century when archaeological finds proved its existence. Same goes for the Hittite nation. One atheist archaeologist said, I'm going to disprove the Bible. All I have to do is go digging around the Holy Land and, and, and prove Luke wrong when he wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts because Luke includes so many historical details. And yet when he began to dig around the Holy Land, he found that Luke was an accurate historian. In fact, came to the point that he went to the Bible first to figure out where to dig because he found out that it was so accurate historically. There are more than 25,000 archaeological sites in Bible lands. Nelson Gluick, world-renowned archaeologist, says this, It can be categorically stated that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. The historical accuracy of the Bible has been substantiated time and time again, under, unlike any other ancient book. And then you take the medical and scientific accuracy of the Bible especially when you compare it to ancient texts. For example, when we talk about the blood, in the time of George Washington, barbers actually doubled as doctors. You know why? Because their principal method of treating sick patients was to make an incision in the back of the knee or in the arm and drain out what they called the bad blood. Many died from this procedure, including George Washington himself. This procedure was also practiced by all the surrounding nations in the time of Moses. And yet Moses wrote about the importance of the blood for life in Leviticus chapter 17, where he said the life is in the blood. Where did he get that idea if he didn't get it from God, since all of the other doctors and so-called scientists of his day had a different idea? Then the Bible talks about the seed of the woman. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible predicts that the coming Messiah would come from the seed of the woman. Now this tells us that a woman has seed. God told this to the first two people on earth, Adam and Eve. Man did not discover this fact, though, until 1922 with the invention of the microscope. Before then, most people believed that the woman's part in reproduction was simply to provide a place for a man's seed to grow. And then you have the Bible's concept of infection. Around 1900, doctors realized that disease and infection could be spread, so they started washing their hands before and after surgery. Well, prior to this time, doctors would perform an autopsy on a dead person, perhaps one who died of a communicable disease, and immediately, without any hand washing, examine a living patient. But in Numbers 19 and in Leviticus chapters 13 to 15, Moses commands that a person contacting a dead person be quarantined. It seems that Moses discovered the benefits of quarantine long before anybody else did. Where did he discover that? It had to be from God himself. And then let's talk about waste disposal. In some underdeveloped countries today, waste is simply thrown out the back window. Now, this was the common practice in the days of Moses. Writers of that time record the infestation of flies and rats and other disease-carrying organisms thriving on sewage and waste. In the Middle Ages, this was the cause of the bubonic plague. But in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 12 to 14, Moses commanded the Israelites to bury their wastes. A person having any type of discharge from the body was actually isolated from the population. And then look at the views of the cosmos, of the various ancient cosmologies. Do you realize the ancient Hindus thought that the earth was held up on the back of four strong elephants? When the elephants had to scratch, the jiggling caused an earthquake. And these four elephants stood at the back of a big turtle, and that big turtle swam in a sea of milk. The Japanese taught that the earth was on the back of a giant catfish. The ancient Greeks taught that a strong man, Atlas, held up the earth. But in Job 26, verse 7, the oldest book in the Bible, you find this simple statement. He stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Job lived some 4,000 years ago. And this is amazingly accurate from what we know of astronomy today. The earth is hung on nothing. But the first part of that statement is amazing also when it talks about he stretches out the north over empty space. 
We know that our solar system is on the north edge of our galaxy. To go any other direction would take you across billions of stars. To go north is to pass two or three stars and then literally billions of light years of space. The Bible demonstrates amazing medical and scientific accuracy in contrast to all the other ancient texts. And then we have the unity of the Bible. Think about it. The Bible contains hundreds of themes written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years in several different countries by men of various occupations, from kings all the way to lowly uh, fishermen. And yet, there is an amazing unity of thought throughout the Bible. There is one major theme with no contradictions. Norman Geisler says this is a, an especially valid point in view of the fact that no one person or group of men put the Bible together. Books were added as they were written by the prophets. They were collected simply because they were considered inspired. It is only later reflection which has discovered that the Bible is really one book whose, quote, chapters, unquote, were written by men who had no explicit knowledge of the overall structure. Their role could be compared to that of different men writing chapters of a novel for which none of them had even an overall outline. Suppose I would assign you the assignment to write a chapter of a novel, but I told you you could not confer with each other, and I didn't give you even the plot line for the novel. What would you come up with if each of you wrote a chapter for that novel? It would be a confusing mismatch of a book. Not so with the Bible. There's an amazing unity, even though individuals wrote it without collaborating with one another. And then you have the indestructibility of the Bible. Let's look at the manuscript evidence for other works of antiquity and compare that with the Bible. For example, Caesar, when he wrote his histories sometime between the years of 144 BC, the earliest copy of Caesar's histories we have available was actually written in AD 900, a thousand years later. And we only have 10 handwritten copies. Now I speak of handwritten copies because since the printing development of the printing press, we could crank out those copies and each copy would be the same. But before the printing press, the copies of literature had to be cranked out by hand. And it is possible that a scribe, as he is copying uh, a piece of literature by hand, could make a mistake and put down a wrong word or a wrong uh, phrase. But we have other copies to compare that with, and so we can find out where the mistakes are. Well, with Caesar's writings, we have ten copies to make those comparisons. Plato, he wrote sometime between 427 and 347 B.C. Again, the earliest copy we have of Plato is dated A.D. 900, time span 1,200 years later, and we only have seven handwritten copies. Or take Thucydides. The earliest copy we have of Thucydides was actually uh, dated 1,300 years after the original, and we only have eight of those handwritten copies. With Sophocles, we do a little better, although his, the earliest copy we have is 1,400 years later. We have 100 handwritten copies, again, by which we can cross-check and compare to see and make sure we have the original autograph. Take Euripides. The earliest copy we have of his is 1,500 years after he wrote. And we only have nine copies. Or Aristotle. The earliest copy of any of Aristotle's writings we have is 1,400 years after he wrote. And we only have five handwritten copies. Now, I don't hear anybody doubting whether or not we have Aristotle's writings. But compare that to the New Testament. New Testament was written between A.D. 45 and 95. The earliest copy of the New Testament we have is dated A.D. 130, only 35 years after the original. And we have 10,000 plus manuscripts of the New Testament. Now, compared to other works of antiquity, we can be very certain we have a reliable copy of the original text of the New Testament because of the manuscript support. In fact, we have more evidence to support the text of the New Testament than we do any other work of antiquity. For the New Testament, as I said, we have 10,000 plus manuscripts that is handwritten copies before the invention of the printing press to check and cross-check so we can be very certain that the original text is preserved. On top of that, the oldest known manuscript dates back to A.D. 130. It's a John Ryland's papyri, 
and it's a fragment of the Gospel of John written about 80-95, just 35 years previously. Both the great numbers and the early dates of these handwritten written copies guarantee that we have the original text of the New Testament well preserved for us today. The scriptures have been indestructible. Many men have tried to destroy the Bible and its integrity over the years, but all have failed. Voltaire, the noted 18th century French philosopher, said that it took centuries to build up Christianity, but, quote, I'll show how just one Frenchman can destroy it within 50 years, unquote. And that's what he set out to do with his writings. And yet, 20 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society purchased his house for printing the Bible. It later became the headquarters for the British and Foreign Bible Society. Voltaire did not destroy the Bible. It is still a bestseller today, being printed in his own home. And then finally, we have the power of the Bible to change lives. If you have read the Bible and believed it for yourself, you know the change it has brought to you. A South Sea Islander proudly displayed his Bible to a World War II GI. But the soldier said, ah, we've outgrown that sort of thing. The native just smiled. He said, it's a good thing we haven't. If it wasn't for this book, you'd have been a meal by now. The Bible can turn cannibals into Christians. It transforms lives like no other book. It can transform your life as well. Now, given all this evidence for the reliability of the Bible, we can trust this revelation.